for a rewrite. Well, welcome heroes. This week we're talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart right now because I just had the worst night's sleep. I was up, I think that you can define it as micro naps. So I had micro naps throughout the, the night, just waking up constantly, not sure what's going on. And there's been a bit of a pattern of this. I'm starting to realize as I compare with other people's sleep patterns that maybe there's been a, a long time pattern of maybe not getting the best sleep that I could. And that's why I sought out and basically um, harassed our, our guest today, sleep coach uh, Audrey Wells, who's going to be talking to us today about how to get better sleep. She is a doctor. She is uh, the purveyor and coach at supersleepmd.com. And she's going to help talk me, because I'm a big baby about this, about when you might want to start examining your sleeping habits. What is a CPAP machine? Is it necessary? Are there other methods in order to do it? Does it make you less than if you have a machine helping you breathe every night? These are things in my own stupid human brain that, that bounce around and keep me from taking action or maybe getting a sleep study formally and finding out. And I have some hangups and hesitation about that. So basically, this is a way for me to get someone to come on and give me some tough love. And I hope that all of you learn from this experience as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Audrey first. Audrey, could you let us know a little bit about how did you get into the position you are now as far as being a professional sleep coach and adding that on to your practice that you were already doing? What was that journey like for you? Yeah, I uh, am happy to talk about it. And I think it's kind of noteworthy that you say you're being a big baby because I actually <laughs> started out in pediatrics for my- Oh, uh, <laughs> well, there we go. This is perfect then. <laughs> it, it is perfect because really when people are sleep deprived, they're kind of reduced to toddlerhood. And so- I, I have agree. All the skills to, to deal Just with- Just ask my kids and my wife that have to deal with me in the morning after a bad night's sleep. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I-, I um, I did uh, my pediatrics residency. I did a peds uh, pulmonary fellowship. And during that time, uh, it actually came onto my radar that you could get subspecialty training in sleep medicine, which was amazing because uh, sleep has always been important to me. I am not someone who has a lot of tolerance for um, sleep intrusion or not sleeping mm. enough. So, you know, in my childhood and, and growing up, it was emphasized as a performance tool, which was great because I took advantage of that. And I feel like it really helped me in my academic career. Mm. Um, so I did a formal sleep medicine fellowship and then went on to practice uh, in both academic and private practice settings for about 15 years. Um, Along the way, I did get boarded in obesity medicine as well, and there's tons of overlap with uh, problems with sleep and, and people who have issues with weight. And so oh, that kind of uh, synergized and helped me, uh -huh. you know, I think, uh, treat people. And in that journey, um, I became frustrated, actually, because the medical delivery system is not set up very well to work through sleep problems with patients. And there's a couple of ways to look at that. So one example is people who suffer from insomnia most often need some uh, behavioral treatment, some cognitive behavioral treatment in order to get better without having to depend on medication. But okay. I was only able to see people, you know, every couple of months for a little 20 or 30 minute visit. And it's just not enough. And the same with sleep apnea. You know, I was very good at diagnosing sleep apnea after a home test or an in-lab study. But the truth is people can have a lot of trouble acclimating to sleep apnea treatments, CPAP being the main one. And I couldn't, work with people enough on that um, as they're kind of going through that journey. And it's relevant because what's known is that if you're somebody who needs CPAP treatment, your acclimation in that first week predicts your long-term success. So that's what kind of um, motivated me to kind of take my skills outside of the clinic and offer 
uh, consultation or coaching for people who were struggling. Got you. Wow. You have so many little journey, not so little journeys and stories that you added to your competencies with obesity and with sleep health and with pediatrics and in order to add those things on top of each other and then to start coaching as well. I love that you saw that there was a lack as far as the traditional medical model, the Western medical model of the 20 minute session that you saw people like at the most once a month and probably not even that often with people's yeah. busy schedules and how that wasn't, it wasn't getting the results you wanted for your clients and for your, for your patients. And so you sought out a way, which is perfect for coaching, longer sessions, more of a, you know, you can do the, the medical, but also it's, there might be things holding people back from wearing their CPAP machine, going and getting a sleep study. Um, why, why are you maybe buffering with other things to your point, like, mm -hmm. like that lead to obesity and things like that, if you're not taking care of your sleep? Um, what things might be going on in your life where you're not, you know, getting the sleep hygiene that you need, or you're not setting yourself up for success because of external factors, there wouldn't be time to do that in the traditional model a lot of times. And so you actually found a way to, to make it work re regardless by opening up a coaching practice. Um, there were a couple of things in there that you talked about as well that I've recently become in my mid forties, I decided I wanted to get into great muscle shape. So I decided I wanted to become an amateur uh, bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised to learn that the most important thing really is rest and recovery. Yeah, And Absolutely. that was a big light bulb moment for me because I thought, well, I have to go more often and lift more heavy and break down my muscles more often. But that's not when your muscles grow. Your muscles grow during recovery. And the largest segment of your recovery where your muscles grow is if you're giving them enough nutrition is when you are asleep. Mm -hmm. And if your sleep hygiene is not dialed in, all things being equal, if someone does have great sleep hygiene and another person doesn't, that, that person that doesn't will not grow as fast, will not get as much um, of the effects of being able to, to build muscle and have it be healthy and be, and be able to maintain it and recovery. Um, so this has become, because of that especially, has become more of a thing that I wanna learn about. Like how can I improve my my daily sleep right now and the CPAP machine has been brought up I am a very loud snorer mm. um apparently um my wife has the earplugs in every night still can hear me a little bit through it I think my kids tell me whenever we go on a vacation together and we're in a hotel room that like it's crazy so it's something that I would like to address for my partner <laughs> long term um it's and it's also something that obviously if that's happening, I have heard that that can lead to bad sleep hygiene, things like that. It might be some of the reasons that I'm waking up at night. And so can you tell us a little bit more about kind of that process of how you go through and evaluate whether someone should have a sleep study um, and then kind of maybe lead that into the use of the CPAP machine? What is it? Mm -hmm. Like, why does it seem like all of a sudden more people are getting it? I've noticed a lot of people in the bodybuilding community swear by it. Mm -hmm. They just go and get them because even if they don't feel like they have bad sleep hygiene, they know that if they get on a CPAP machine, it will actually help them get faster gains, which I just kind of blows me away. I would love to hear you talk about all of that. Yeah, and, and I'll start by kind of endorsing what you're saying that when you sleep well, it's the best performance enhancer that's mm. natural. You know, you <laughs> yeah, it enhances your mental capability. It enhances enhances your physical performance. It even enhances your emotional regulation and your ability to problem solve and make uh, decisions. I mean, even your motivation to work out and go on this bodybuilding journey can be improved if you have good sleep under your belt. So, you know, on all points, getting healthy sleep is totally worth it. And it's an investment. It is, it's an mm -hmm. investment in your brain and your body. Now, um, sleep apnea is really, really common. And you're in that age group where you're starting to accumulate risk just because of your age and mm. your sex. So males and postmenopausal women are at higher risk for sleep apnea. Uh, and then coupled with the snoring, I would say, yeah, doing a sleep study should be on your radar. So I want to explain what sleep apnea is. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, which is the 
most common form of sleep apnea by far is a breathing disorder that occurs during sleep. And I want to make that really clear because a lot of times when people say sleep apnea, sleep is a common term, but apnea is a little bit wonky. It's, it's out there. Yeah. What does apnea mean? Yeah. Apnea means without breath. Okay. And I want to really underscore that point because, you know, if you were having trouble breathing during the day, if you had asthma, if you had COPD, if you had pneumonia, you would want to get that treated right away, right? Because yeah, obviously of course. it's affecting your health. And with sleep apnea, what's happening is you're repeatedly stopping breathing during sleep because when you're asleep, and particularly during REM sleep, for example, you get collapse of the throat tissues uh, anywhere from the back of your nasal cavity all the way down uh, to your epiglottis. So there's potential for that collapse to happen at multiple levels, and you're literally choking off your air. Mm. Now, your brain is so driven to sleep that it will tolerate that for a bit. So in order to score an apnea, you have to have the stopping breathing or a compromised breathing for at least 10 seconds. Oh, okay. Now that's important because the number of airway obstructions that you tally up over the course of a night tells me whether or not you have sleep apnea and also how severe it is. So up to five airway obstructions per hour of sleep time is considered normal. Okay. I'll just let that sink in for a second. 10 yeah. seconds, like a full 10 seconds. That seems like an eternity to me that somebody isn't taking a breath. For sure. And, and yeah. some people, you know, they really go up without breathing for 30, 45 seconds. No way. Blood oxygen levels are just wow. tanking. And the brain is not really um, responding because it's trying to get sleep. There's so many important processes that occur during sleep. Your brain is literally choosing sleep over oxygenation, which is hmm. hugely problematic. So um, mild sleep apnea is between five and 14 airway blockages uh, per hour of sleep time. Moderate is between 15 and 29. And I'll just point out that right at the border between mild and moderate sleep apnea at 15 airway blockages per hour of sleep time, if you were asleep for seven hours, that would be 100 blockages. Wow. In one night. Okay. Yeah. So significant, right? Very. And during that time, your airway, uh, your oxygen levels are going down. And then at some point, your genetics and your, um, your sensing of, of your gas exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to prompt your brain to wake up. Usually kind of overcome yeah. that <laughs> blockage, which your wife may be able to talk about a lot. Oh, yes. I'm sure she can comment on that extensively. And I'm a big fan of the wife. So I always try to advocate uh, because yeah. usually the wife is sitting in my office like this. And, <laughs> and you know, the, the recovery is a brief arousal from sleep. But when you are perceiving those awakenings, it means that you're you've been awake for about three to five minutes. That's when the awakening makes it into your conscious awareness. But more than likely, a person who has sleep apnea is going to have a lot of interruptions in their sleep that they mm -hmm. don't even recognize. Yeah. So the drop in the blood oxygen level and the awakenings from sleep are very problematic. Um, not only does it compromise your sleep quality, but those drops increase inflammation in your body. So oh, inflammation wow. is connected to all kinds of medical problems. Oh, yeah. And it also triggers a stress response in your body. So I'm talking about cortisol release. I'm talking about inflammatory mediators coming out. And over time, this leads to health problems. Even the next day, you'll notice foggy brain, not really... Um, remembering, thinking clearly, your emotional uh, regulation is off. But because it happens slowly, it's kind of like the frog in boiled water phenomenon. You yes. kind of lose touch with that and you're establishing a new normal where you're underperforming. 
Now, t can you help us? Let's say that there are some people that are like, okay, I'm, I'm a big baby like Aaron. I've been thinking about going get a, to get a sleep study or something. What is the first step usually that let's say that, you know, normal person either has a corporate job or maybe they're an entrepreneur, they have a health plan of some sort. Yeah. What's the first step? Do you need to go and talk to your general physician and then tell them you're maybe having some issues and then they refer you to a specialist like you? How does that usually work? So I, I think there's kind of the optimal way uh, and then maybe there's some wiggle room with that. I think when um, you're talking about going for a sleep evaluation, what I would strongly recommend is seeing a uh, board certified sleep specialist. Um, so mm -hmm. an MD who's had specific training in sleep medicine and works at an accredited sleep center. And uh, to find an accredited accredited sleep center, you can go to sleepeducation.org, type oh, in your perfect. zip code, and it gives you a little um, map of what is nearby. Now, these days, there's a lot of telehealth appointments. Um, you, can, you may see a, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant initially, but it's always going to be a sleep medicine physician who interprets your sleep study. So I want to give some reassurance there. Insurance companies uh, often dictate what the first testing measure is. In other words, um, if you have a Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, your plan may say that first you need a home sleep apnea test. Now, that's great if the question is, do you have sleep apnea? Um, because the home sleep apnea test is pretty good at detecting that but if it's negative you want to go in for the in-lab sleep test which is a bigger um, more inconvenient test and i, mm -hmm. I want to validate your feelings like this dread that you have about kind of taking the steps to get the evaluation is very common and if you like i can go into more detail about that but um, typically people don't need a referral these days to see hmm. a sleep specialist. You might call your insurance company to find out and to find out, do they really mandate the home test first or do they mandate the in-lab sleep study first? That is fantastic information. Thank you. Everyone that's listening to this and might be in a similar mindset as me, just like those first couple steps of even how do I get started or get going? Now we have some terminology and some ways to think about going about it. We can go check out that website to make sure it's an accredited place and then move forward from there. Now, once someone has, let's say someone has a sleep study done, whether it's the, uh, the in-home one or they go in and they, they do the, the more inconvenient one, but probably more thorough one where you go on site. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, let's say that you like, okay, you do have sleep apnea, whether it's mild or whether it's severe or whatever it is, we're recommending that you get put on a CPAP machine. Mm -hmm. In my mind, they are these huge things that go over your face and are super uncomfortable and like you're never going to be able to sleep well again. It almost seems incongruous with this is going to help me get better sleep mm -hmm. because it feels like there's something on my face, like from the movie Alien, um, a face hugger that like is going to make it so that I can't roll over. I can't sleep on my side. Like it's going to be inconvenient. It's going to be weird. What if I travel? All these these reasons start popping up in my head. Can you Dem I, re I probably know that I'm wrong. Can you demystify this a little bit for me? There's probably been amazing advancements on what these look like, how portable they are, what your choices are. I would love to hear some of your thoughts about that. Yeah, and and I am going to back up a little bit because I, I want to dispel a myth, which is that mm. um, I think some people think once you kind of start that ball rolling with a sleep evaluation, the end point is going to be you bring the CPAP machine home and now you have uh, a new accessory on your bedside table. Like, okay, that is not a one, -to -one relationship. Um, and especially for mild sleep apnea, the data do not suggest a um, as much of a risk for long term health conditions compared to moderate or severe sleep apnea. Okay. So, um, for mild sleep apnea, there's definitely more choices for CPAP alternatives. And for people who have mild sleep apnea and who are not sleepy, it becomes a choice to not treat and just w do watchful waiting. And I advocate for people really taking that power to choose and get informed. That's part of what my company does is to 
um, say all of the things that I wanted to tell you in your clinic visit in my office, but I didn't have time and you didn't have access to me. So, mm -hmm. um, so with the sleep study, um, you're going to either do it at home or in the sleep lab. And this is going to be an objective measure of what your breathing and oxygenation and body movements are doing. Now, I want to tell you, um, don't expect it to be a typical or a representative night of sleep. It's not going to be that. Um, it's kind of like Heisenberg's principle. Like once you <laughs> look at something, yes. you change what's happening. But the yeah. advantage to studying sleep, particularly in the sleep lab where you have sensors on your scalp, is that I can factor out all the times you were awake and just look at your sleep because those brain waves are telling me objectively when you're asleep. So, you know, the, the in-lab sleep test is a more um, thorough study. It tests for more things than sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, more inconvenient. I've had four of them in my life. So I can speak from experience that you know, it's a, it's kind of like a colonoscopy, right? You put it on your calendar and I think you cross it off and move it a few times before you decide you. <laughs> um, the in lab uh, home, or I'm sorry, the home sleep apnea test is more convenient, but there's a blind spot there. So because it involves fewer sensors and because there's no sensors on the scalp to show me brain waves, it means that um, there's some chance for a false negative result. What that uh. means is if it comes back normal, but you have these symptoms, then I really need to take a deeper look with the in-lab sleep study and make sure that we're not missing something. Uh, however, if it comes back and it's positive, I would say that's good information and you can proceed to looking at treatments from there. Got you. Thank you for those clarifications. Um, yeah, and I can see that, like you said, the Heisenberg principle, like with something observed usually changes because it, because you're being observed and you know, you're being observed. Um, and that was one of the things that kind of made me a little standoffish about going in and perhaps having that larger study done is because I'm not, I'm not in my bed. It's not my regular environment. Of course, I'm not going to have as good a nights of a sleep. Is this really accurate if that's the case? So thank you for talking us through. It really just helps you to take away when you're awake when you're actually sleeping, actually get hard data that you can't get with the, for lack of better term, lighter touch at home study where you can't control all the, those variables. So that's, that's good to know. Um, when someone comes to you, they've gone through it, they've done the evaluation. Let's say that they don't wanna do the CPAP machine. Mm -hmm. I believe that you actually have something available for people to learn about some of the other things they might want to do that might help improve sleep as well, that um, in addition to, or instead of using an apparatus like a CPAP machine. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And I'm hoping maybe you have a, a resource for us that we can <laughs> think we can share with some of our listeners as well. For sure. Um, yes, this, this is really common. And, you know, you talked about the mask kind of going over your face. I know exactly the picture you're referring to. <laughs> as, um, you know, patients have shown that to me. And yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in, right? And the whole process is a little bit vulnerable because your sleep is a state of unconsciousness. So coming into a sleep lab, you know, you're, you're asked to kind of lie down. There's a sleep technician watching you with a camera. You're in your pajamas. It's like mm -hmm. an invasion of privacy, right? And I want to be vulnerable. so respectful. Yeah. Like it, it's a challenge. It's an ordeal. Mm -hmm. um, but th the goal is to get information so that you can make informed decisions about your health. Full stop. And that's kind of what... Um, my course about 21 plus alternatives to CPAP is meant to do as well. So people ask me all the time, CPAP, oh my God, is there anything else out there? Is this all I have? I just want to sleep normally again. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, it's your decision. It's 
totally your decision. I'm here to provide information based on science and based on data from each individual, but it's your decision what you want to pursue. And I think that you know, it, it's worthwhile noting CPAP is the most successful treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, but the major caveat there is only if you use it and you need to use yeah. it throughout the night to really maximize the effectiveness. So in my uh, CPAP alternatives course, I talk about things like oral appliance therapy. I talk about uh, procedures to open up the nose. I talk about the Inspire treatment, which is a hypoglossal nerve stimulation treatment that is pretty big in the news lately, and other things that people have not heard about um, because there's a landscape of alternatives, truly. And it's you know, it's um, an unbiased opinion. I wanted to bring some credibility to this question about alternatives to CPAP. And I wanted to do so from a place of, you know, nobody's paying me. This is my clinical experience. And I um, have uh, some personal experience with things like the oral appliance. I've stopped short of having a surgery <laughs> to try these treatments out. But I wanted to kind of let people know what people who had the Inspire treatment were like afterwards. Would they do it again? What was the procedure, you know, and how how much was left out of advertisements or, um, yeah. you, know, the, you know, there's a lot of marketing. Um, a lot there. of marketing. <laughs> and Side effects may include. <laughs> for sure. And it, I think going into um, this course, what I'm hopeful for is that people get their questions answered and they can have a more productive and faster conversation with their sleep medicine physician or their surgeon or their dentist. That is my hope for the people who are just done with CPAP. This is fantastic. Um... Andre, this is, I love that you have that resource available. It sounds like you have it wrapped in a course so people can do some self-education to know more about this. So if they're, you know, like me at the extreme side, big baby, or maybe they had a little further down the, the, the path and they're like, no, I kind of know that I want to do this, have it done, but they at least know what's available and can self-educate a bit before they approach a physician or have a sleep study done. I think that's going to be very, very valuable for people. And I know that for anyone listening to this, like seriously, I know specifically for me, I got interested in it and started examining more of it because of the fact that in the bodybuilding community, there's a lot of talk about that rest and uh, other than nutrition and lifting of weights, the actual rest and recovery period is the thing that actually makes your performance go up. And there's a lot of high performers I know that are listening to me right now that work in the technology industry, that are entrepreneurs, that are also coaches all over the place. And if you want to perform at a high level, and you already consider yourself a high performer, a, something you may be leaving on the table right now and not aware of is your sleep hygiene. And so I'm definitely going to be <laughs> going ahead and looking at that resource that Audrey's going to be presenting for us or letting us know where, where you can find more about that. But really, this is something that I feel like we should all be looking at because as you've pointed out to us in multiple ways, well, during our conversation, it affects so much of your waking life. Your emotional regulation contributes to obesity factors, long-term health. And for anyone that's in mid-age and, and higher, like me, it becomes more and more important. It's like compounding interest, either negatively or positively, if you take some steps now. And the good, good news is you can take steps with experts like um, Audrey around. So Audrey, thank you so much for your time. Aaron, I, I would also just add that if you're someone who considers yourself a high performer, not looking at optimizing your sleep is totally <laughs> incongruent <laughs> with that. Idea. Agreed. <laughs> I am abashed <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the website for um, finding an accredited sleep center is sleepeducation.org. And the course that I'm talking about with CPAP alternatives, or I have other courses meant to help people diagnosed with sleep apnea, acclimate to CPAP therapy. All of that can be mm. found on my website, which is supersleepmd.com. 
supersleepmd.com. We'll make sure that's in the show notes, everyone, as long as, uh, as well as where you can find that resource with those 21 alternative methods that Audrey was talking about as well. So Audrey, thank you so much for being with us. I feel like I just want to steal you and enroll in all of your courses now so that I actually take the steps I need to, to actually in reality, be a high performer, not just during my waking hours, but also while I'm sleeping so that I can start to achieve more and more. So thank you for your time today. You're very welcome, Aaron. My pleasure.